Hello, my name is Adam Badawi, and I'm the Deputy Global Editorial Director for GQ, and it's my privilege to be your moderator for this session. Today's panel is titled, Gender and Climate, Grow Women's Leadership. People increasingly recognize that climate change is a great existential threat, both to humans and to our planet. But what is less understood and less frequently discussed is that extreme weather and other climate impacts are also gender problems that disproportionately affect women. Today, we're going to explore the intersectionality of the challenges we collectively face, both in climate change and in gender inequality. Why and how are women more vulnerable to the effects of climate change? And how can we counter environmental injustice and enable even more women to become leaders for climate action in their communities, countries, and regions? We have the immense privilege today of being joined by a diverse set of female leaders whose ambitious and thoughtful and innovative work uh, has intersected with this space of gender and climate. They are scientists, they are advocates, they are policy makers, and they are uniquely shaping this important conversation. Though their fields of practice differ widely, we're going to discover the threads that connect these leaders. We'll learn from them what the next steps are in empowering more female leaders in climate decision making. Please join me in welcoming our panel. Her Excellency Professor Judy Wakungu, Ambassador of Kenya to the French Republic, Portugal, Serbia and Holy See, and the former Kenyan Cabinet Secretary for Environment and Natural Resources. Dr. Emily Choi, a postdoctoral fellow at the Natural Resource Sciences at McGill University. Dr. Sita Coleman Kamala, President for the Center of PFAS Solutions. Nizreen Al Saim, Chair of the UN Secretary General Youth Advisory Group on Climate Change, and Professor Catherine Ngila, the Acting Executive Director for the African Academy of Sciences. <laughs> Let's begin zooming in on the major challenges that climate change is creating for the women uh, that you've all been working with. Um, Judy, we'll start with you. I mean, you're very, very familiar with this nexus of climate change and gender inequality. You hosted a UNEP conference on gender and the environment in 2014. Yes. How have you seen this relationship between climate and gender evolve? And, and what role are you playing now to really tackle those challenges? Well, we live in a gendered world, and I think we, we all know that. We live in a gendered world. From my perspective, which is mostly distinctly, uh, African, I would say it even differs from culture to culture, ethnicity to ethnicity, in terms of just how we live in a gendered world. Climate change and the vagaries of climate have affected all of us, both men and women. But when I look with my broadly uh, cultural lens, I say that women are disproportionately affected. For most of Afro-Africans, when we look at the food that we eat, 70% to 80% of the food that we eat is produced by women. Our agriculture is rain-fed. We are now going through cycles where we're going through cycles of flooding, through cycles of extensive drought. And women are the mothers. Women are the people that are supposed to feed their families. Women are in charge of of food security. And this is women, whether they're agriculturists or whether they are living in pastoral uh, communities. So the pressure on women to provide food and just enhance their families' livelihoods is truly under a lot of pressure. Let us also not forget that when we produce food, we are relying on the land. Women don't have land rights. We are trying to improve land tenure systems so that women have land rights, but it's improving slowly, but it's a bit too slow for some of us to deal with some of the realities uh, that we deal with. It's a tough struggle, um, but also we are working, say, with um, agriculturalists to provide a climate-smart agriculture. Uh, women, of course, are the knowledge holders of our indigenous seeds, which we know during the vagaries of weather uh, fare better uh, than, say, the modern agricultural uh, seeds that are, are provided. So it's just to give you an example of the fact that we live in a gendered world. 
it is not equal. Different communities, even in our own country, are, are being affected differently. But overall, when it comes to what the national government is trying to do, we are trying to provide more access to women in order to have a more equitable society. So many interesting intersections you touch upon there, whether they're economic, agricultural, and also in community leadership that we see from a lot of women. Uh, leadership that is often um, uncredited or unofficial, but nonetheless extremely real. Mm. Emily, your studies of beluga in the Arctic have allowed you to connect with some indigenous communities as well, and those communities have been disproportionately led by women. Can you tell us a little bit more about what your research revealed to you in terms of both climate and gender? First of all, the Arctic is warming at such a rapid rate. It's climate change is just heavily impacting the communities in the north. So they're, again, the Arctic is changing very, very rapidly and the communities, northern communities are feeling the impacts. And what I've found from working with these communities, they're very, of course, they're very concerned with the welfare of their whales. They're an important traditional food. Um, and there's really an issue with food security, the impacts of climate change on these whales. So for example, um, so again, uh, Beluga meat is extremely nutritious. It's very high in vitamin A, vitamin C, vitamin D, as well as omega-3 fatty acids. And there are many stories, um, studies that have shown that traditional foods, such as beluga maktak, are much more nutritious um, than store-bought foods, which are often expired by the time they reach the north and extremely expensive. So um, climate change is impacting, is impacting some of these traditional harvests, uh, which are very important to the communities in the north. Uh, again, for example, you know, while I was working as a scientist with these communities, um, they had been telling the scientists for years that the whales were getting smaller. And uh, then uh, within a few years, uh, one of the, the scientists from Fisheries and Oceans made that showed that the beluga whales were getting were declining in growth rates over a 20 year period. Uh, so, again, the um, quicks of climate change are heavily impacting the um, but I found that working in, as part of these programs, uh, there's strong involvement of, again, as we mentioned, female leaders. Uh, all of the youth, uh, uh, so I've worked with Indigenous youth. All the assistants that I've had have been women. I've worked a lot with the elders who have, again, shared their knowledge with me on the impacts of climate change in the North. And, and so they've been very heavily involved with these research programs. And, you know, as long as there's there's opportunities, I think that um, women have been taking a leadership role uh, in the monitoring programs to look at the climate change on these traditional harvests and, and predators. Sita, I know you have a, a very deep passion for female leadership, and I would love to... I'd love for you to share a little bit more about why female leadership is just so urgent in these decision-making processes around mm. climate and just how absent they've been at, a, at their highest levels. Wow. I'd like to answer that, I think, at two levels. One is, you know, leaders, women leaders, and then women leadership. To me, leadership is not just a domain for leaders, right? When I go, um, you know, wherever we've been, my husband and I have been working with, uh, specifically in waste and waste management and plastics waste in India. Mm. Almost all of that, virtually all of that at the ground level, you know, day to day, street level is done by women. Yeah. Uh, women who, you know, they're basically called rag pickers. I mean, in the informal sector, you call it what? They just work day and night to sweep and clean, and it gets turned over, and you know, people pick the most valuable stuff, and they're picking again, they're sweeping the streets. And, um, you know, organizing that work is also done by women NGOs. Mm. And we worked with one in Bangalore called Sahas, you know, Wilma Rodriguez, I think she's a tremendous leader. I'd like to call out, you can go look at our website, Sahas, but she realized that in order to make it work, for the housewives, because those are the ones who are actually bringing out the trash, you know, putting it out on the street, and the maids who are bringing it out, she really has to go and teach them how to, what, how to separate out, you know, the potato peels from the plastic waste. Mm -hmm. Ground up, she's done a tremendous job bringing back also some of the older, you know, tech technologies or the tricks that, that we knew, that is that, you know, if you just sprinkle some cow urine on just compostables, they degrade faster and they become very rich. 
So she did what I call was a totally integrated bottom-up approach to waste management, keeping the streets clean. And her challenge is further down in the value chain, as I call the value chain of the recyclables, are all men, right? And they actually get the cream of the money. Yeah. So there's actually no, if you look at the economics of the recycling or waste management, you know, most of, the, most of it doesn't reach the people who are actually doing that work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, the whole recyclables markets go up and down, and uh, they are really the victims of this, right? And then there's a whole change in technology and street sweeping coming up. So um, I think women's leadership in that particular regard was tremendously important because women are the ones dealing with the day-to-day -day of keeping the house clean, yes. keeping their neighborhoods clean, keeping it clean from you know vermin and rats and whatnot. And the organizers are women, and the people who are doing the work are women. And this is true also in some of the other developed countries. Yeah. Um, so that is at the waste level and then at the climate level, of course. You know, I mean, all the, the ones who are rattling the cages are all women. And I think Pew Research showed that um, women, in general, I think it was some percentage, feel climate change as a more urgent crisis than a majority of the men that were polled. Yes. Well, Ms. Rain, you, you're 26 years old, and I think you're a prime example of uh, a future leader, although it's very easy to argue that you're currently <laughs> a leader in your day-to-day -day life <laughs> right now. But you talked about how you're existing as an intermediary between these two very different worlds, and how have you found that process? Yeah, first of all, before I answer your question, I have a question for Judy. What is the average number of cows? In Kenya? For the brides. For the, for the brides. Depending on where you are in the community, I would say cows, maybe 90, camels, maybe 40, goats, maybe 200. Yes. Yeah. So in many communities, females get traded by cows, camels, and other kind of cattle, actually. And the valuer you are, you get more cows and more camels that you will not see any of them because it will go to your father or your brother or the person who is actually responsible for you. And this is not only a, uh, a policy issue, but it's also a cultural issue. But the different situations we are living in every day um, just assured us that the policies that the country takes change the culture. For example, she banned plastic, single-use plastic in Kenya in 2017. And now I don't think Kenyans remember how they were using single-use plastic. Mm -hmm. This is a very sad um, example, but I, I, I need to set it. So in Sudan, we had a very progressive country. We had the first women in parliament in the 60s. We had uh, equal payment from the 70s. Mm -hmm. We had maternity leave from the 50s. We had women driving cars from the 50s too. I mean, all of the rights of the women were perfect until we had a government that thought that every these are wrong. And now we are fighting for the very basic rights of females after more than 70 years of progressive uh, actions towards females. Sometimes, unfortunately, but sometimes it's fortunate when we have good leaders that understand how complex it is. They can actually influence bigger number, they can influence more, and they have the rule of law, which is something that scientists doesn't have, unfortunately. They are there anyway. So we have to educate them. We have to make them aware at least of the priorities and the top priorities of the issues that we are facing in the grassroots, in the yeah. bottom yeah, yeah, level, so they can actually reflect that on their policies on the national level, but also in the international level. Um, I think every woman that in Sudan that actually walks four kilometers a day to access clean water mm -hmm. for their family is a, a woman leader because it's a long walk I cannot do as a city girl. Every woman has actually have to make sure that someone will come to her house to help her deliver the baby. Um, for me, is a woman leader because we have hundreds of babies delivered in Sudan every day, but no one knows what circumstances are these babies going to deliver in. Uh, I think females um, who actually um, suffer to uh, cook 
food for their families every day because they are just inhaling all of these vibes coming out of the the burning wood or the burning charcoal mm -hmm. are leaders because they die at the age of 30, maximum the age of 35, because they will have lungs problem. Um, and I think all of this unseen leadership, all of this privilege that we all take for granted mm -hmm. is, is really, really back to are we really solidating with other women who have other circumstances? Are we as scientists really supporting these uh, females? And if we are supporting these women, how much are we helping their problems and their issues? And how much influence we can have on our politicians, our policy makers yes. and decision makers to actually help them in their life? I mean, climate change is a matter of priority. And for me, our communities who suffers the most but contribute less to climate change, females who are by far more impacted than other population, and the young kids who are actually suffering to have a future in the future. And I think all of us here in the room, scientists, policymakers, males, females, need to push more for climate action because we don't have any other option. It's this or dying, all of us. Mm -hmm. What you hit on, Nazreen, especially regarding this, this notion, this fact that the people that are contributing the least to, to climate change are disproportionately suffering the most, exactly. really hits at the injustice that's present here and the need for more leadership around this topic. Catherine, you won the L'Oreal Award earlier this year for your contributions to sustainable water manage, uh, management. I'd really love to know your thoughts about how climate and gender issues have intersected in your work. No, thank you very much, Adam, again, and also thanks, uh, Nasreen. Quite exciting to uh, hear some of the uh, issues that are really real issues that are impacting on um, on societies, particularly more to do with women. Um, in my research area and also for the award, the Laurie Award, um, I won the award um, uh, because of uh, water research uh, management, uh, in particular looking at uh, how to monitor water coming up with technologies that can be able to, um, you know, identify or establish if water uh, is clean and is also suitable for drinking. This is more so important because uh, when you look at, um, okay, uh, you can look at um, societies, we've got access to water. But the question is, how clean is that water for drinking? Uh, and also when I look back, uh, as I was growing up in the rural areas, I remember we used to go to the dams, uh, we go and swim, and after we have sw swum in the same, you know, water uh, uh, body, we, gain, we go and fetch the same water mm -hmm. to drink. So looking back, and I'm just wondering, how did I survive, you know, all those years? Because um, really, that was really, you know, you, you, it, it is really terrible to be able to ex be exposed to that kind of situation. So for me, when I look back in the rural areas, I'm asking myself, I see communities are drinking water. This is borehole water. They have dug underground water. People are just interested in you know, digging these uh, boreholes just so that they can be able to get water. But my biggest question is, how good is this water for drinking? So these are some of my uh, you know, issues, and I grapple with these issues as an analytical chemist, as a water research scientist, I'm always so disappointed that we do not have facilities, good infrastructure, to invest in, you know, uh, in societies, in universities, in institutions, yes. so that we can be able to have research, you know, correct research, and we can be able to see what is happening. We can make use of research uh, for evidence-based, so that we can be able to solve problems, societal problems. In my research, uh, when we developed um, nanotechnology materials, I was saying that the ability to be able to commercialize these materials, you can be able to use uh, these materials as cartridges in uh, societies, in uh, rural areas, so that every single woman in their rural home, they, they should be able to have uh, the ability to filter water so that they are assured of the clean water. Yeah. So this is my dream, to be able to have a system that is bounded in each one of these um, uh, villages in the rural society so that they can be able to clean water for their domestic consumption. What I loved about that round of conversation was just how much each of you are pushing towards action yep. 
right, and pushing towards, uh, pushing past this paradigm to a much better one and the urgency behind that. So I know for a fact that no one on this panel is interested in navel-gazing, sitting here and talking without any solutions. Mm -hmm. So uh, we all have a collective desire for action on climate and gender inequality. Let's talk about solutions. I'm going to ask each of you to give short, sharp answers, really decisive key messages around solutions for this. Um, let's keep it short, because I do want to keep time, if possible, for a few audience questions. Emily, what's, uh, what is a solution you might encourage uh, to help female leaders in the Indigenous communities you've seen? Well, I mean, I think it's so important for not only policymakers, but for scientists such as myself to work with communities in the North. Uh, again, I, I found that I was, my program was one of the few community-based monitoring programs study the effects of climate change on predators. And it was so important, um, and, you know, in terms of indigenous traditional knowledge to listen to the communities. And again, it's so important for women to be leaders within these programs. I, again, I worked on traditional foods, women prepare the foods, and, you know, they are enthusiastic and eager to be engaged, uh, you know, from the youth to the elders. And so it's so important for scientists to work with communities, but also to engage women within these communities as leaders. Judy, can we, or rather, how can we insist that national governments uh, adopt more inclusive climate policies? Well, I think I have proven my case by enacting laws, uh, which was very hard. I think I missed out one law, which was also the Water Act, uh, which I enacted in 2016. Uh, 2016, I also enacted the Climate Change Act. I was the lead author and the lead strategist going into all the COPs from COP21 up to now I'm sort of on the, on, in, in the background, but I'm still making noise. Going to, to, to Glasgow, we must address issues of loss and damage. If we don't address issues of loss and damage, I mean, you have heard what the esteemed panelists have said about women's position. Loss and damage has to be addressed. Um, the issue of climate financing has to be addressed. Uh, even now, governments are dithering in terms of the big emitters are dithering as to when are they going to uh, make their contribution when it comes to the 100 billion US dollars that was promised here in Paris in 2015. So some of us are calculating, even though we're not mathematicians, we're saying that in 2021 it's 600 billion dollars. You know, that's what we want to to, to address. Catherine, what point of focus do you think should be a priority right now to address gender inequality and climate change? Um, I, I thank you again, Adam, and also thank you to Judy um, for those very insightful ideas. Um, for me, I feel that um, when you look at the three areas that we need to focus on, which is um, risk management in climate change or in mitigation for climate change, and so adaptation methods and mitigation, uh, women must be involved in decision making, yes. almost, uh, you know, going to, towards the, um, the rural areas. Uh, we, got, we have got women groups. And so yeah. these women groups need to be um, trained on various ways of uh, tackling climate change, whether it is in agriculture, whether it is in water, whether it is in energy and so forth and so on, so that they can be able to have optimized and also better ways in which they can deal with some of these issues of uh, water, food, health, and, um, and, and uh, also energy. Uh, capacity building, like I said, is very, very important. And also, they must be involved in uh, you know, climate financing. Yeah. Uh, they must be able to be allocated funding yeah. to, to tackle some of the issues that are really affecting them you know, on the ground. Thank you, Catherine. Nazreen, I know you are extremely passionate about taking action and not just talking about taking action. What do you think about the current urgency level of major political leaders when it comes to the climate? Well, they need to be changed. <laughs> and, and because, unfortunately, the issue uh, that we are having right now with the political leaders are not that they don't understand. They understand very well yet they don't have the will nor the power to actually get out of this, let me say, the evil triangle of influence, interest, and financial flow. 
And if you are not able as a leader to actually set the priorities of the people that you are actually leading, then you are not a leader, simply. We vote for leaders, right? And it's our turn right now, as also as a citizen, not only as world leaders, to say that, well, it's so simple, I'm not giving my voice, my vote to anyone who doesn't really care about me or my future generation or my kids. I'm not giving my voice to anyone who doesn't care if we are roasted or drowned under the water or anything happened to us just to stay in power. Mm. I'm not giving my mm. voice to someone that does, doesn't care about the future of the Earth in the first place. And instead of they are investing more in going to moon or Mars or whatever. Um, I think, I think the, the biggest issue even with the world leaders that we have today is they, they lost this communication with people. And sometimes, and, and I think this is the sometimes that we all say, sometimes, th this is the sometimes, mm. radical actions is the only way that we can survive and radical action is the only way we can actually take things forward. Um, having said that, they are, there are some good practices happening. We need to highlight these good practices. Mm, right. and, um, and we need to have more women in the national level so they can go up to the international level. Absolutely. So a change from inside the country needs to happen uh, before us talking about the multilateral era and the multilateral um, situation and level. So there is a lot of work to do, not only to change the world leaders, but also to make a case that world leaders are leading us. So if you don't want to lead us to our interests, then you are not leading us, you're just surviving yourself in your chair. And by making this very clear, I think their chairs will shake and they will start <laughs> touching the chairs like, okay, now I can do things um, the right way. And I think this is what we can do and this is what we are doing right now. Let the chairs shake. <laughs> yes. Sita, what solution do you think should be a priority right now? You know, I think your question, I was going to question your question, which is the national governments, I don't, I don't think national governments can solve, can be a solution to climate problems. I really think that um, we have to go back to hyper-local solutions, which is where the connections to women and women's wisdom, as we're talking about, comes in. Um, when you look at water harvesting, it's really all about you know, catching the water in catchment areas. Mm. It works best. Women used to collect in India. There was a whole wisdom on you know, rainwater harvesting. There was all hyper-local. So there was a feedback loop to supply and demand, how much water there was. They, you know, they, they corrected the demand and the use. So none of this about centrally produced. Nobody knows how much is produced and be overused. So you really have to go back, I think, to uh, hyper-local solutions also for energy. If you look at what happens with solar, you know, if you have a solar panel in your house, you're constantly looking to see how much power is going because it's now, you know, it's now produced by you, yeah. right? And then you're actually selling it back to the grid. So it's changing your consumption patterns if you go back to a hyper-local production of energy and water. Mm -hmm. And that then brings it back to women to me. They will be in control. They won't produce excess, they won't consume excess. Yes. I think we have to go back to those kind of solutions. All these national solutions have delays, wastage, a lot of money is wasted by the time the money comes flowing down to the ground. So I would challenge your question, I think, stop thinking about national government policies. They ain't going to save us. Full stop. Macro and micro working together. Uh, that's just about all that we have time for today. And I hope you'll all agree, for those in our audience and those watching at home, that this was a compelling and urgent and uh, very much an inspiring discussion. To our panelists, I'm so grateful to each of you for your contributions as, as well as for your continued leadership. Thank you. Audience members, please join me in thanking our phenomenal panelists, Her Excellency Professor Judy Wakungu, Dr. Emily Choi, Dr. Sita Coleman Kamala. Nazreen al Saim and Professor Catherine Ngila, thank you so very much. Appreciate you. Thank you.